my name is Kwame Owino. I work at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and I welcome you to the webinar this morning. Uh, so every year since uh, 1999, the IEA holds uh, the pre-budget forums. And the function of the pre-budget hearings, uh, two, one, is to basically bring in voices from both the private sector and other sectors um, to contribute and to present their views about what budget priorities they would like government to concentrate upon. So that's the first. And the second one is to provide an opportunity to create public education around uh, how the budget process works and to try as much as possible to harness the voices of citizens in shaping that budget. Uh, so we know that uh, the budget calendar is determined by the constitution. And obviously in, and in late August, the treasury sent out a circular asking for, for Kenyans to prepare uh, representations and to prepare uh, proposals which might be considered in the budget that comes in next year. So the process is a long one, but it starts and it's very, very systematic. So we are glad that you're here together with us at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And our hope is that collectively we may contribute and have discussions among ourselves about what budget priorities government should concentrate on. But the way we do, do it as the IEA is to split it into two. One, so today we have uh, representations and presentations from the private sector and um, private sector basically, and then tomorrow we'll have the social sector. So by private sector, we say profit making farms and social sector would be priorities in social policy, which might be education, health and, and, and among others. So we're privileged today to have with us uh, representations, uh, presentations uh, representing a variety of sectors. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, so for the, for the IEA, uh, what we will do is that at the end of these two presentations today and tomorrow, we will consolidate those presentations and synthesize them and present it as a memorandum for ourselves, but also on behalf of those who attended this meeting. But we also use this as an opportunity to create broader education around how the budget process works, uh, to help uh, citizens to appreciate um, the challenges of prioritization, but also at the same time create uh, the public, uh, good public pressure that is required for the government and decision makers, both on the legislative side, but also in, in the executive to understand what the, uh, what the priorities and the, the priorities rather um, and the spending, spending priorities are for citizens generally and collectives. So today we are represented, we have uh, three, uh, three uh, presentations. Um, uh, one from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we've been our partners for a while. And then we'll have another from uh, Global Water Partnership, basically on water and sanitation. And the other would be from uh, um, Take a new institute, Dr. Tim Jaggi presenting on agriculture. So without further ado, I'll ask my colleague, um, our colleague, Jobwa Johi, who is head of policy research and advocacy at the Kenya Association of Manufacturers to make his presentation. So Job, uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, good morning and uh, thanks so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, sorry, Job, just before you go ahead, I, I apologize. Sorry, uh, just some rules. Uh, so two things. We will keep the camera on the presentation so that when job starts, please do not interrupt him. So we'll have everybody else's camera switched off, including mine. Uh, if you have any questions while the presentation is going on, uh, you could type it on the on the on the chat uh, so that they can be collected in time and presented to, to the presenters. Uh, and and the final one is please keep your uh, your cameras and microphones muted while the presentations are going on. So my apologies once again for the interruption. Job, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kwame. I uh, was saying uh, for this opportunity and uh, for the collaboration that IEA and uh, CAM has been having for quite some time uh, to better our economic governance, uh, to come up with sound policies to ensure that we are operating within uh, a sound macroeconomic environment. Uh, so I would only ask that we continue with this spirit uh, for the betterment of our country. Uh, so allow me to look uh, for the presentation uh, to just a minute. Stay about content only. I hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, we can see each other. Thank you. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, this morning I'll be presenting on uh, uh, national pre-budget proposals that have been prepared uh, by manufacturers. 
Uh, and the theme of uh, my presentation or the topic of my presentation is of, uh, on uh, from uh, surviving to thriving. Uh, and this is based uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, ensuring that we, we are reworking uh, fiscal south uh, uh, for the manufacturing sector during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because it's not yet over. Uh, uh, the, the flow of my presentation or the table of content of my presentation is going to look into uh, manufacturing industry-wide proposals uh, or sector specific. What I mean in this is that uh, we have uh, proposals that have been developed that are affecting all the manufacturers uh, within the industry. Uh, and then there are those uh, because within manufacturing sector, we have about 14 subsectors. Uh, we have those that are drawn now from the subsectors. If you're talking over the chemical and allied uh, talk of food and beverage, uh, 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 leather and footwear, uh, textile and apparel, you find that those that are specific to those sectors that are, we have developed. Uh, so we have captured what uh, is uh, important uh, for uh, for our discussion uh, this morning. Uh, we are also going to look into the mis miscellaneous fees and levies act, uh, VAT act, uh, public finance uh, financial management act, uh, PFM act of 2012, uh, the income tax uh, act, and then tax project procedure act, and uh, as well as uh, excess tax uh, act. Uh, so jumping quickly into the contents, uh, you'll see the first one we are talking of. Uh, we're talking about the import declaration fee, uh, which country starts at 3.5% uh, uh, for industrial machinery and spare parts uh, of chapter 84 and 85 uh, of the tariff book. Uh, so our proposal is uh, that this is reduced from 3.5% to 1.5% to one uh, on industrial machinery and spare parts. Uh, we have this provision uh, for uh, raw materials and intermediate products. Uh, so we are asking that the four now categories in the raw materials, intermediate products, uh, industrial machineries and spare parts. Now the fourth one are covered at a 1.5. And the reason why we are calling for this is that um, you if you look at the IDF provisions in the ESC region, uh, it's only manufacturers in Kenya that are, are paying these. Uh, and those who are in the EAC are not uh, paying out uh, the, uh, the IDF. Uh, clearly, this puts manufacturers in Kenya at a, at a cost disadvantage. Uh, so you find again uh, that our main competitors in the, in, in the EAC, uh, when you talk of Uganda and Tanzania, uh, 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 it, it implies that manufacturers in these two countries have a cost advantage uh, relative to those who are in the country. So if we we'll see a reduction by 2%, will be edging closer uh, to our competitors in the region and ensure that our goods are remaining as competitive as we have envisaged uh, for, the long, uh, for the longest. Uh, moving to railway development levy, uh, currently stands at 2%, uh, still for the same industrial machineries and spare parts of chapter 84 and 85. The argument is the same, uh, that uh, why can't we put this down to 1.5%? as we have put it for the raw materials and intermediate uh, products. Uh, again, you realize that when you uh, get uh, to our competitors again, uh, like now Uganda has an equivalent infrastructure development level of 1.5%, but you find that now Tanzania, also a major competitor in the region, uh, has, not, uh, in, uh, has not implemented the RDL on industrial machineries and the spare parts, uh, the raw materials and uh, intermediate products. So it will see a reduction again by 0.5% will do great service uh, to the manufacturers and drive the competitiveness, job creation uh, in the region. Uh, next is on uh, levies and charges in several laws. Uh, to, like for instance, when we talk of the crop, uh, that is oil and nuts regulation 2019, uh, the, or the sugar regulations, uh, you'll find that uh, there is multi multiplicity of uh, various fees and charges. Uh, you find there is duplication of the same. So what now we are asking is, that can we have an amendment of the Miscellaneous Fees and Levies Act 2016, uh, which can help in the prohibition uh, of uh, national government regulatory agencies to impose arbitrary fees and charges, which are again hurting uh, the competitiveness uh, of, the, the, uh, of the manufacturing sector. Uh, the justification that we are putting across uh, is the purpose of the miscellaneous fees and levies Act 2016 was to provide for the imposition of duties, fees and, and levies on imported or exported goods. However, uh, levies and fees are being charged by national regulatory agencies. 
Uh, unfortunately, some of these levies are being imposed without consideration of the regulatory burden of the industry. So uh, we are look, trying to look at how we can ease the burden uh, for, uh, for the for the industry as far as the regulatory overreach uh, is concerned. Because you find where, when a body has been established or an authority has been established, it has an act of parliament or it has a regulation. That regulation more or less must be supported with some collection of revenues or you find that administrative procedures are becoming too many uh, for the industry and there is also uh, uh, there is also a uh, cost in time that is utilized in passing uh, through those administrative uh, procedures. Uh, the other one is on a credit ad adjustment voucher. Uh, the credit adjustment voucher uh, were issued out by the National Treasury out of uh, the refunds that are, are arising uh, from the pre previous VAT refund formula. Uh, so you find that uh, the formula that was there before the amendments were done was punitive and uh, it was leaving uh, too much credit on the hand of the National Treasury uh, to the disadvantage of the manufacturers. Uh, so what now we are asking is that uh, we have an, ad, uh, an amendment uh, to uh, to uh, uh, section 17 uh, uh, clause 5 of the VAT Act of 2013 uh, so that now we can add a condition where VAT excess credit shall be paid to a registered person by the commissioner of uh, tax arising from the VAT uh, uh, from the VAT formula. Uh, so if we see an, 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 an adjustment uh, to the income tax, uh, to, sorry, to the VAT Act of, uh, uh, of 2013, we'll see much of this credit that is uh, in the credit adjustment vouchers uh, being paid out uh, to uh, the manufacturers. And the reason why we're asking for this is so that we can increase the cash flow of the manufacturers. And once we have the cash flow of the manufacturers, uh, this will lead to uh, further exportation. This will lead to further job creation. This will lead to further investments because they have uh, cash uh, on their hands. Uh, we move on to uh, to withholding VAT two percent. Uh, this again was reduced about a, about two, a year or two years ago uh, from six percent, and uh, we congratulated the National Treasury together with KRA for the reduction. Uh, from 6% 6, 6 to 2%, but now we are asking for the reduction of, uh, of the same from 2% to 1%. And the reason why we are asking about these is that uh, withholding VAT as it was established, it was not a revenue uh, collection measure. It was to help to know where uh, transactional business has uh, taken place. And uh, uh, subsequently, they are able to tell that uh, out of that transactional business, they're supposed to collect 16% uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the... Uh, from the from the uh, from the input and the uh, input and output tax. Uh, so uh, out of this, uh, we are now feeling that, um, uh, that that the 2% withholding VAT some time uh, stays longer before uh, they are processed back uh, to because anyway it has to be processed back at the end of the uh, at the end of the day because it's a question of having input uh, minus out, out, uh, output tax. So if we can have the reduction uh, from 2% to 1%, uh, this is going to help in uh, a reduction of the buildup of credit uh, for taxpayers uh, due to a lower rate. Uh, so uh, this is another, uh, another, uh, another, another, another fiscal uh, proposal, a uh, fiscal, fiscal policy proposal that we already taken to the National Treasury and hope is going to be considered because they're not looking at collection, collecting revenues out of this. Because in the past it has worked, and now they have been able to integrate the buyers and the sellers, and they're able to tell, to tell where the transaction business has taken place. Uh, we, look, we look forward for uh, their uh, consideration and implementation of the proposal. I move on to withholding VAT exemptions certificate for manufacturers in perpetual credit position for 24 months. Uh, what we are calling is a lane statement uh, of uh, section 42A, uh, that is uh, subsection 4A. Uh, this uh, subsection talks about uh, exemption uh, by uh, the cabinet secretary or by 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 uh, the by the, the by the commissioner general KRA uh, of any manufacturer who has been uh, compliant uh, is known her, his his or her track record is known for a period of time such that they don't have to wait for 24 months uh, for the withholding exemption certificate uh, to be to be cleared by by national treasury or to be cleared by by KRA. Uh, so the, our justification is that the affected manufacturers are always in fat position. Therefore, they need to reduce the burden uh, of, uh, of a refund on, on ITAX. 
Uh, the affected manufacturers uh, also have VAT refunds uh, withholding VAT and also the credit adjustment voucher. So you find that there's an array of refunds that are that, that are due uh, for the manufacturers, and this has really crippled uh, their, uh, their 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 cash flow uh, very much. So if we see the exemption coming probably in six months or uh, in eight months instead of waiting for 24 months, uh, this would help the cash flow uh, for the manufacturers. 16% VAT plant and, ma and machinery on chapter 84 and 85, a uh, use of manufacture of goods. Uh, this was again introduced uh, in 20, 2020, uh, and it really affected the, the, the manufacturers who are already in the process of importing uh, the machineries, uh, the, the spare parts. Some would be uh, asked to pay VAT at 16% after the passage of, uh, of the law, uh, to a tune of 20 million, 30 million, 16 percent VAT, something that they, are, that they are not projected in their books. Uh, so you find uh, when this law came into place, it had a, a, a major a cash flow effect uh, on the manufacturer. So what now we are asking is that can we have exemption uh, from VAT uh, for the plant and machineries of chapter 84 and 85 uh, of used uh, used for manufacture of, uh, of goods? If we can move to exe exemption uh, a bracket, uh, this would help the manufacturers as far as uh, their cash flow is concerned. Because one of the things that you realize, once you pay the VAT out, uh, the process of uh, getting your funds back uh, is really a, a big challenge uh, for, for manufacturers. And then you find that uh, the additional 16% that has to be paid is, is, is putting some constraints uh, on the, the cash flow uh, and the liquidity of the manufacturers. So the sudden policy change, as, as, as I had earlier explained, affected the manufacturers in 2020 uh, for who were, who, were, who were forced to look for extra cash uh, to clear their goods when they were coming uh, into the country. So if we get the exemption of this, it's going to help as far as the cash flow is concerned and administrative procedures are, are lessened for them. Uh, the other one is on prompt payment of refunds. Uh, we had uh, this proposal, uh, we have had this proposal for the last uh, two years, uh, calling for tax uh, refund fund establishment. And this uh, will call for the change of the uh, of the PFM uh, Act of 2012. Uh, so that now we have a fund uh, that is uh, dedicated uh, to refund of all the outstanding uh, refunds uh, to the manufacturers. And not only to the manufacturers, let's talk about uh, to the private sector. Uh, to, so that we can uh, increase the, the, the cash flow uh, within uh, the, the private sector. So a tax refund in the excess amount uh, is the excess amount of tax that, that a taxpayer has paid to the government arising from any uh, of the taxes. So it is therefore, uh, it therefore should not be considered as government revenue and reimbursed upon confirmation of the same. So looking at how this process can be done as quickly as possible. We don't have to wait for years or months for this to be completed. We're looking at how we can wait for days, uh, maximum of 60, 60 days. And uh, with the tax refund fund, uh, this uh, can be possible. Uh, and, and even the manufacturers cannot uh, feel the burden of paying uh, their, their due taxes to the government because they know uh, that uh, they will get back their refund uh, within a very short time. Um, we have uh, this other proposal on investment deduction allowance. Uh, what we're asking is that can we revert back to the previous position uh, whereby we had 10% uh, IDA uh, for Nairobi, Mobasa, and Kisumi. Those, these are the big cities in the country. And then 150% IDA outside of Nairobi, Mobasa, Kisumi. We're talking over uh, the other rural counties. Uh, and what this does is that uh, you see that uh, it, when we have ID at 150%, uh, being imposed in rural counties, uh, counties that are beyond Nairobi, Mobasa, and, Kisu, uh, and Kisumu, you see there will be industrial development. There will be investment that are going to happen in such counties. But uh, uh, if you even you look at the statistics when this rule changed, uh, it is only those who had, who had started before uh, it was put at 50% overall within the, the whole country, uh, that those investments that are going, but you find that they're still lagging. But now, uh, uh, new investments coming into the rural areas, uh, they have lagged because of such measures, uh, which are punitive, that have been, uh, been put up. That's why we're asking for the reversion. Uh, we go back to 100% Nairobi, Mobasa, and Kisumu, and uh, we have 150% uh, so that we can see 
county investments uh, happening and, uh, and, and movement closer to where the raw materials are, especially when you're talking of us as an agrarian nation. Rather than having industrial bases in the cities, let's have industrial bases in the rural areas. So that even we can drive a job creation uh, in such areas. Minimum tax, uh, there's another whole debate. Uh, remember uh, that the minimum tax was annulled by the High Court uh, on 20th of uh, September. Uh, we have a, a Court of Appeal uh, case that is going on at the moment. Uh, but uh, it, this does not stop us from uh, uh, discussing some of the thresholds that have been put, because even these, some of these th the thresholds were put even when uh, the court case was going on. Uh, for instance, when you're talking about reduction uh, of exemption of investment threshold for the last four years from 10 billion, because this word was provided in the Finance Act 2021, to 400 million, you'll see that uh, we'll bring as many uh, manufacturers in this bracket uh, who can be able uh, to invest 400 million in uh, in four years? But you find that is a very big handle uh, for anybody to invest uh, 10 billion in four years uh, in 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 the country. So this is going to encourage uh, many investors uh, to support minimum tax. At the same time, uh, have uh, have these exemptions one, once they are able to hit the 400 million mark within uh, four years. Um, then we have earning before interest, tax deposition and, and amortization, it's called EBITDA. Uh, this was int again introduced through a Finance Act 2021. Uh, it looked at how uh, we, we, we could change or, or it changed from uh, the previous position of debt to equity ratio of 3, uh, 3 uh, to 1. And uh, then it capped the deductible interests uh, from EBITDA at 30%. Uh, so what now we're looking at is that that percent is very punitive because there's another 70 percent that before was uh, legible uh, for, 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 for deduction in the books of account, but no one cannot uh, deduct this. And you find that uh, it has had uh, the, the cash flow and, uh, uh, of, of the manufacturers. So we have put a four, uh, four proposals uh, which can be considered by the National Treasury. One of it we are putting is that uh, can we retain uh, the previous position of debt to equity ratio that, that means it's going back to the status quo uh, or reversing the finance act 2021 uh, to the previous position uh, as opposed to the, the to limiting the interest uh, of EBITDA at 30 percent the other thing also uh, that can be considered if we cannot adopt number number one the second scenario can be borrowing from registered financial institutions uh, commercial banks uh, uh, microfinance and whatnot should be exempted from uh, this provision. Uh, the other uh, proposal is, can we introduce a threshold uh, of excluding the first 400 million of debt from EDIBA uh, uh, workings? That means we can retain the 30% of, uh, as it is proposed uh, or, as, or uh, as has been implemented in the Finance Act 2021, but can we have these uh, kicking, uh, kicking off uh, once one has hit a debt of 400 uh, million uh, Kenya shillings. Uh, or if not that, then uh, we can have the carry forward of the current year non-deductible non excess borrowing costs at future years to offset against uh, future uh, profits. Uh, what this is going to ensure is that uh, we have uh, some of the borrowing costs, interest, commissions, and whatnot uh, being pushed uh, forward or carried forward uh, so that they can uh, be offset, can be put in the in the in the in the books of account, uh, and can offset against uh, future profits. Uh, we have relief due to lack of establish establishment of administrative uh, processes. Uh, what we are asking is, uh, we introduce a new provision to give powers to the cabinet secretary of the national treasury or and commissioner uh, commission of tax. Uh, to provide relief to manufacturers in case where there are delays in establishment or set up of administrative processes and structures. Uh, what we have uh, come to realize in the past is that uh, once we have a tax that has been introduced, uh, if administrative processes have not been put in place, uh, the structures have not been put in ITAGs, uh, have not been put in the, in the, in the customer platform, uh, then you find that uh, there are liabilities that come to the manufacturers two, three, four months after because they were not able to collect the due taxes uh, because of lack of administrative processes, guidelines, and structures. Uh, one example I can give is a 10% uh, excise on the plastic. 
uh, it was introduced again through the Finance Act 2021, but it has taken us taken us now three uh, to form uh, three to four months without guidelines in place on how this uh, should be done. Uh, so it is out of this that now we are we are we are asking that uh, when uh, Kenya Revenue Authority or National Treasury they have not come up uh, with uh, the the right procedures uh, to be followed and administrative processes and structures to be followed, then they should be at uh, liberty. Uh, to exempt uh, the manufacturers at uh, that period that administrative processes and stru uh, structures ha 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 have not been established uh, so that we don't see liability are coming on the part of the manufacturers. 10% uh, excise tax on plastic, uh, I've talked about this a little bit, uh, 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 plastic materials used for packaging. Uh, what we're proposing that uh, we have removal of this excess, uh, excess tax on plastic and the justification that we are putting across is that uh, we have like now what we call the extended producer responsibility uh, this is a process that has been established between cam ministry of environment and at the moment it is NEMA that is charged in implementing this ensuring that is collection of all the plastic materials that have emanated from a certain factory uh, and uh, this is a process that, uh, that, 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 that is currently ongoing. But now with the introduction of 10%, in fact, that is a double effort that has, that has been put here on this side, the discharge that has been implemented on the plastic uh, material. On this other side, you're trying as much as possible as a manufacturer uh, to implement uh, the external producer responsibility. The other thing is that you find there is unfair trading or unfair business that comes, uh, comes through. Uh, the goods that are coming pack packaged in plastic materials uh, or are imported packaged in plastic materials are not uh, charged the 10% excise tax. It's only those that are uh, produced uh, within the country. And that establishes, establishes a fair and, and unleveled uh, playing field and making uh, Kenyan good uh, less competitive. Uh, again, you fight because this excise tax is not uh, in the country. Uh, uh, manufacturers can move their primary uh, products across uh, to Uganda, Tanzania, uh, park from there, and because we are operating under a custom territory, they're able to pass back uh, such products when they are packaged back to the country without paying uh, any excise tax. And uh, that uh, is a loss not only to the country from loss of jobs and investments, but also a uh, loss, uh, loss to other countries uh, because of uh, the, the better and conducive environment that business are, are, are feeling are established in those countries. And in future, we are not likely to see the trickle, a trickle in of the investment in Kenya, but uh, in Uganda, in Tanzania, because of such uh, punitive excess tax that are coming through. Uh, another one is uh, annual inflation adjustment on specific rates. Uh, this was due to be introduced uh, 1st of October 2021. We have not seen the Gazette notice one uh, because there is a uh, a court case uh, that put an injunction uh, against the implementation of uh, the inflation adjustment uh, on specific rates. Uh, it was supposed to come through at 4.97% uh, on specific uh, excise rates. And uh, now what, what we're feeling is that can we have a moratorium? We don't have to uh, wait for the court case to be finalized. Can we have a moratorium on the implementation of uh, the annual inflation adjustment on specific rates? Uh, because this is an additional cost. Uh, if I would give an example of fuel products, uh, we had an increase, increment on fuel uh, or petroleum and petroleum products uh, on 14th of September. Uh, two weeks after, this was supposed to kick, to, uh, to kick in, and a liter of petrol was supposed to increase, increase by about a shilling or 1.5 uh, shillings. Is a, this is an, is an additional cost uh, to the consumer. Uh, so what we are asking is because we have had turbulence in the, some of these sectors, can we have a um, moratorium and an implementation of this for the time being because uh, Kenyans are feeling the hinge, uh, the, the, the heat? Uh, and then after that, instead of having annual inflation adjustment uh, coming through uh, every year, we are looking at how this can, can come through after every two years so that uh, we can caution, and especially manufacturers at the moment and the private sector in general, uh, from the effects uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. You find that uh, those that are already targeted by the annual inflation adjustment are uh, the same uh, that have uh, been hit uh, mostly by the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. And this is going to be uh, uh, too much burden for them uh, uh, at the moment. I've come to the end of my presentation. 
I'll be guided by Kwame whether I should take answers at the moment or should wait uh, uh, until other presenters are done so that we can, uh, we can take uh, questions uh, together. Thank you so much. And back to you, Kwame. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Job. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll allow others to make a presentation so that we can have the questions together. So if anyone has questions, please keep them on the side or put them in the chat box and we'll ask. So thanks a lot, Job. You've taken us through most of the constraints to businesses and some of the uh, 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 priorities that you'd like government to consider, starting all the way with levies into the VAT, uh, income tax, excess, excess tax, and of course, uh, I think the, the 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 one that is most memorable for me is the excess tax one, which is about a, a moratorium on the implementation of the inflation adjustment, but also talking about the inflation adjustment being uh, reviewed so that it's not every year but every second year. I think the total facts, uh, the totality of the facts you mentioned to us is a suggestion about what Kenya's public tax uh, policies. I think you have all these taxes, levies and everything else all working together and their constraints on manufacturing and their, the effects that they have in as much as obviously uh, government's intent is to get, uh, parliament's intent is to is, is to extract revenue. But the distortions that they create and how they, they, they create burdens for businesses to continue and also to be efficient is very interesting because of obviously, as you mentioned, the competitiveness, the levies, even the VAT and how it is applied is creating, um, um, is not creating a level ground, it's giving advantage to other countries in the region, uh, starting with the RDL and all that. So, uh, so thanks a lot for that. Um, we have, it's clear to us that part of what needs to be done is actually what this year's, the next financial year's finance bill will look like. And I think this is a, an area for, for more public engagement because this year, uh, the effects of taxation on top of taxation and their total tax effects. In as much as everybody blames the KRA, actually the, 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 the responsibility should lie with the Treasury on one side and with the, with the National uh, Assembly for, for tax policy. But I think tax policy is, you know, is one area in which with the next budget, or with the next budget financial management year coming through, I think it's clear that um, a proper realignment and a philosophy of taxation, but also its application and administration is something for Kenyans to, 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 to consider because we have a, whole uh, maze of taxes here and there and um, uh, the ease and the compliance effects alone, leaving aside what their total effects are on, uh, in terms of uh, 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 keeping money away and liquidity for companies is, a, is just a different matter altogether. So thanks a lot, Job. Uh, I'll come now to our second presenter. And our second presenter is Mr. George Sanger, who's the regional, inter regional coordinator for Global Water Partnerships in East Africa. And he'll be talking about uh, WASH. Uh, the, Title is Towards a Strategic Framework for Water and Sanitation and Health Climate Resilient Development in the Face of the COVID-19 Pandemic. So what kind of investments should government make and what's the policy approach for this? So George, is George here? George Sanger? Uh, well, it doesn't look like George is here, so I think we'll just have to make the to wait. Uh, let's find out from Rafael if he'll be here. In the meantime, I hope Timothy is here so that we can go straight to speaking about sustaining recovery amid multiple shocks, agriculture sector outlook. So, Timothy and Jackie. Um, hi, hi Kwame, I'm here. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Thanks, Tim. You have 20 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kwame. Um, just allow me to load my slide. So, again, uh, we, I would like to thank um, the IEA for organizing the pre-budget hearings and uh, inviting us to be part of this. And uh, we are really enjoying the partnership um, uh, with IEA, especially in uh, uh, building capacity for the public to be able to engage in the budget making process and also to kind of be aware of what is happening. So this year uh, we are looking at uh, uh, how we can sustain uh, recovery within the agriculture sector. Unfortunately, we are still, uh, the sector is still being faced by a number of shocks. So as a way of introduction, so we acknowledge that, that the sector has played a critical role in cushioning the economy from the uh, COVID pandemic effects. And um, even with the revised data that we recently saw from uh, KNBS, I think we see that the sector still plays a key role in the economy for the country. But uh, we, we still 
kind of have the long term challenges. Of course, one one, the first one being the effects of climate change and weather variability. Uh, already uh, the KMD has signaled uh, that, you know, the, rain, the, the 2021 short rains are going to be poor. And even the forecast going into the long rains for next year uh, is not is not optimistic. Um, and we have consistently relied on rain fed agriculture. Um, and that's why, you know, even the initial forecast of a good performance this year was contingent on us having good rainfalls. So unfortunately, we still uh, held by, by, by the weather. And any time the weather doesn't favor us, then the sector performs poorly. Uh, this year, again, we've seen uh, high production costs. Um, again, this is something that is not affecting the sector alone, but it's uh, somehow affecting all other sectors. Uh, starting with, uh, if you look at, uh, for, for example, the, the, the fuel and transportation costs, uh, we see right now we have uh, an, an almost 40% increase from January alone. Uh, and if you are to compare that with the costs that we faced last year, then we all, I think for some of the inputs, uh, you'll see that, uh, for example, like fertilizer, currently fertilizer is about 60% uh, higher than the cost that it was being sold at last year at the same time. So this has been mainly because of a number of issues. One is the cost of transportation because of high cost of fuel. Uh, we've also seen a deteriorating exchange rate uh, this year. And then we're also seeing also some uh, rising uh, costs, especially at the world markets. Uh, again, this is also being affected by what is happening within the oil industry. So this year, of course, looking at right from 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 the beginning of the year, we've seen that you know farmers are actually spending more, um, and uh, ultimately this will be affected in uh, the prices that our consumers will face as uh, the costs tends to be pushed higher. So again, just to remind us that the sector is being guided by. Uh, the SDGs, which has three key goals. One is increasing smallholder productivity and incomes, uh, increasing value addition and agro-processing, and building households' uh, food resilience. And uh, the reason I want to remind this is because this actually informs the basis of which we make our argument today. So in terms of observations, I think uh, uh, the, the, the good performance that we've had this year, uh, it, it was mainly as a result of good weather that favored some of the key cash flow commodities like sugar and tea. Um, and also we were able to quickly recover from the, the shocks that uh, we started the year with. Uh, from 2019, uh, the short rains, we had some flooding in major, in, in key parts of the country, uh, which was followed by a desert locust infestation. Uh, the government and development partners quickly mobilized uh, to be able to tackle the desert locust infestation. And actually by, by June, we had actually brought uh, the situation under control. And then uh, the good weather also favored, uh, you know, production of uh, food, 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 food commodities, uh, and this kind of stabilized. And we we also noticed that you know last year the sector was able to absorb quite a number of people, especially from the urban areas who lost their jobs as a result of uh, the pandemic. Uh, but on the other hand, we also seen a quite an unpredictable policy environment. Um, and again, this is something that uh, touches on what Job has just shared. So first, uh, there has been a change in the regulatory institution, and we seem to be rolling back uh, some of the key policy changes that we had made. Around 2014, a decision was made to consolidate the regulatory institutions into AFA, and uh, right now, what we've seen last year is that that is being rolled back. So AFA is being disbanded, and, and um, the institutions that were were combined to form AFA are being taken back to where they were. So what has done is that each of these has come up with their own uh, 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 regulations and basically they are being asked to support themselves. And part of that is one of the reasons why you feel that almost every other act that is being generated, you know, it, it, it's, it's clear, it has clear revenue uh, generation objectives uh, without consideration on the effect of some of these levies that are being charged. So you'll find that when, uh, for example, the Tea Act was formed, they introduced quite a number of levy. The same has been proposed for coffee, has been proposed for sugar, has been proposed for food crops. Uh, and actually, ultimately, you see that this is just mainly to support the regulatory institutions, but it has uh, very uh, adverse effects uh, on our competitiveness. Uh, then I think Job has also mentioned the issue of taxes. And I think for, for, for the sector, 
Uh, for example, last year we we we, we joined part of uh, the, the team, including KMA, that were lobbying for the for, for the for the were lobbying KRA not to implement the the excess duty uh, revision. Um, because of this, this also hurts uh, our farmers. Uh, of course, the, the excess duties is um, imposed on manufactured goods, uh, but then some of these goods, of course, they are getting their raw materials from farmers. And uh, once once the the, the 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 final product becomes uncompetitive, uh, and we, we we saw that last year, it has an effect in reducing the demand uh, that uh, the the, agro, the manufacturers are getting from farmers. Um, and, and and you can actually cite uh, so we have for example cases in sorghum, we have animal feeds uh, that you know are currently being uncompetitive to the extent that for example if you look at animal feeds, uh, we tend now to be going for you know raw materials from the region, neighboring countries like uh, Tanzania and Uganda at the expense of our farmers. So in the the, the sector also suffered, especially when you look at formal food markets, um, uh, because of the, uh, the, the the challenges we had with the hospitality industry and education. But what we've seen is that uh, with the opening up of schools and uh, the hospitality industry is uh, starting to recover, uh, that has created a big boost on formal food markets, uh, because largely uh, uh, once COVID hit at the peak of the pandemic, um, most of our food were going through the informal chains. Some of the innovations uh, for formal food markets have also kind of slowed down, especially now that uh, uh, the, the formal food market players are, are back, and also the 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 some some of the policies, for example, they need to formalize uh, the businesses and businesses shying away uh, from the tax burden uh, has kind of slowed down uh, the innovations on food on formal food markets. Um, so the current drought, we already have a warning um, uh, that, that has been already uh, being made with the drought being declared a national disaster, kind of also exposes our our underbelly, uh, partly being the persistent failure in agricultural markets. And uh, if you look at this year compared to even the last 10 years that we've had a drought, if you look at the food prices, you know, the food prices in 2017 or in 2011 were almost double what they are now. Uh, and this actually also suggests that uh, we, our population is also vulnerable, especially in terms of uh, their purchasing power, which, which again is consistent uh, with uh, an economy that is still recovering from the effects of the pandemic. So the, the challenge we have now is not just an issue of uh, uh, lack of availability, but also a, a key challenge is lack of distribution. And we hope that uh, with the current measures, to, especially for the vulnerable populations, uh, we will see the government sticking with uh, what they did during the COVID pandemic, which was uh, rather than giving people in kind uh, donations, they, they kind of give them cash transfers uh, for them to be able to purchase what they need, because then they can create effective demand that can move food from areas where they surplus to areas where they, there's deficit. So we hope that the government you know, will be consistent in this um, uh, rather than resorting to the usual uh, practice where we purchase food and then distribute it. Um, the, the other key thing that we also note again from the data, I think this data from the World Bank, uh, you know, as a result of the pandemic, again, this is consistent with what we're showing in terms of vulnerability and um, the need to make sure that households' resilience to, you know, food security is, in, is enhanced. You can actually see at the, at, the, at the peak of the pandemic, which was last year, mid last year, um, we started seeing a recovery, uh, but then uh, that that now has. I mean, we, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was if you consider the period between March to June, we had a lot of households. If this is the left side uh, graph. A lot of households, especially in the rural areas, that were reporting hunger, um, and this was basically because of uh, income constraints. Uh, this kind of reduced to mid last year, but then we see it going up. And when you look at the poverty headcount, the data suggests that uh, it's almost going back to where it, were, it was before. We know that these effects are, uh, are short term, uh, and that's why there's need to make sure that we support the households, especially uh, those in the rural areas as well as in the urban areas, uh, to make sure that um, 
we can return to the pre-pandemic phase as quickly as we can. So if the recovery, if the recovery is slower than this, then it, this is will have more, will bring more suffering to, to, to rural households. In terms of the, the growth rates, this is from the um, from the, uh, the, the the revised data. Uh, again, you can actually see that uh, you know, as as expected, with the favorable rainfall, uh, that uh, crops and livestock subsector were able to uh, register better growth, especially in 2020. But going into 2021, uh, given the current conditions, uh, we expect that uh, probably this will be affected uh, by, by, by the drought, especially if it persists into into the long range next year. So what, what we see as an outlook for the sector, of course, one is that uh, we do expect that uh, globally, the opening up of, of the economy will create effective demand, especially for export commodities uh, like uh, cut flour and uh, vegetables. And uh, we expect that this will boost performance. Again, we also note that um, you know, mainly this uh, largely um, driven by the private sector, uh, and uh, they, they are not necessarily reliant on 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 rain fed agriculture. Uh, the, the, the threat from, from drought is expected to dampen you know, the food crop production and livestock subsector. Uh, but we hope that uh, measures can be made to, can be put in place to, to, to help households deal with, uh, especially the, the, the food security. Uh, and if, 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 if this scenario doesn't change, then we can expect that immediately after the main harvest season, that is at the end of this year and early next year, uh, we should expect an upward pressure on on food prices. So what we are proposing uh, for the for the for this year's budget, of course, one is that there has been consistent uh, underinvestment in agriculture, and uh, we are hoping that you know the, the government can actually start committing more resources. Uh, and uh, the the reason why we are calling for this is that we think uh, that um, the investments in public sector can actually help draw further investments in the private sector. And one of the ways we can do this is by you know, increasing efficiencies of public sector investments. So one, even uh, when you look at last year and, and as has been the trend in the previous years, uh, there's need to coordinate um, investments by national and county government. We are still seeing uh, a lot of duplicity. Uh, and for example, if you consider input subsidies, uh, we have quite a number of counties actually that are, you know, uh, have like the duplicate uh, systems where you have the national government subsidy coming in, but you also have a, another county government uh, subsidy uh, being rolled up by the country. So this has to be harmonized. The, the challenge, of course, has been that um, county governments has been shunning away from uh, the software kind of investments to the hardware kind of investments. Where, and uh, going into an election season, uh, that 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 we can will only be enhanced. So we need to incentivize even for this final budget that the counties will have that they can actually target the software investment so software investments will be, include things like extension and training uh provision of knowledge uh, whereas you know the hardware projects is where they they put up infrastructure and sometimes you know that infrastructure is not supported so for example you can put up an irrigation scheme but you're not necessarily training farmers on how to fully exploit uh, the infrastructure that is put and we actually have quite a number of um I don't call them white elephants, but ineffective infrastructure expenditures uh, that, that we can we can point to. The other key thing, of course, has been that uh, for the sector and especially for the county government, uh, there is um, a lot of inefficiencies on budget utilization and absorption. So that we find that even the little money that comes, we have a lot of challenges in in getting to utilize this. Part of it is because of challenges with the PFM Act, and uh, we are also calling for for Treasury to leave this. Uh, to allow for further decentralization of resources below the county. So right now, it's quite, quite inefficient, especially when you look at uh, the sector and you talk to counties that you have, for example, people in wards, if somebody wants to access facilitation to do activities, they have to come to the county headquarters to, to be able to access that. Uh, the systems that were there before the revolution were that you could access it even at the divisions, but right now that is not supported by the current act. Um, and then, of course, we expect that the government should focus uh, more spending uh, on research. We've been calling for this, uh, and more so on uh, knowledge, information, and advisory services, uh, as well as data and MND. So, part of the challenge, and uh, I think uh, the job you mentioned, and I think uh, Kwame, you alluded to this, is you know using data and evidence to inform what you're doing. And 
and and for agriculture we realize that um, especially if you look at counties they, they, that they're not really investing in any data systems uh, to actually see the impact of what they're doing or to something that can actually help them benchmark and see whether they're making progress uh, within the sector uh, we need to have a, 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 a predictable environment especially when it comes to to the policies regulations uh, and, and of course taxation being one of them uh, but beyond taxation uh, we need to make sure that um, uh, we can actually be able to predict so the of course the key effects we've seen uh, so far has been on on, on taxation uh, but beyond taxation the 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 the, multipli the multiplicity of of levies that are now being introduced uh, again just uh, because we need to support regulatory environment is something that we need to rethink and what we've seen so far is that the ones that have been repealed is where we have seen a lot of um, maybe social media mobilization for example like the dairy regulations where there was a lot of social media mobilization uh, to some to the extent that now that ones were, were called back they were not halted but they were kind of called back but we know at some point they will still come but probably those provisions will not necessarily change uh, if you look at the, uh, the the other key thing of course is the the government intervention in commodity markets again last year we saw a lot of uh, government interference uh, on commodity markets like tea and coffee even where the market itself is not is not collapsing ideally you'd expect government to intervene where we have market failures but in this case uh, we see a lot of interference uh, or interventions even without market failure and again this is based on perceived inefficiencies uh, without necessarily being informed by data and evidence so for example if you, in the case of tea uh, there was a, a big increase in production in Kenya uh, which is consistent Kenya being a big player in the world market if we increase uh, our production significantly we are going to affect the, the global market and you'd expect that um, you know we, when you have an increase in supply and the demand is not increasingly in the same in the same proportions uh, then the price will definitely go down but then what we saw of course was you know, um, allegations that this is price fixing and um, you know interfering with the market mechanism even though it has not failed so th that that kind of unpredictability of course affects the investments and uh, we cannot attract investments in the sector uh, with this kind of investment and it's important to note for example like uh, those interventions although they were made for Kenya our neighbors did not change and um, for example you saw that in the case of tea you know the, the Rwanda really benefited from the confusion within the sector in Kenya then lastly uh, we also need to in strengthen intersectoral coordination uh, because one of the key goals we have right now is to spur value addition and agro processing and we need to strengthen the linkages especially with the manufacturing sector and for us to be able to provide data that kind of shows how these inf investments need to be structured and uh, the challenges especially as job has explained are what we can do to overcome these challenges and make sure that we have um, be able to be pro to be competitive because the idea is not just to value add but to value add and be able to sell uh, to the market without these interventions um so i think uh, yeah i want to pause there and uh, yield back to Kwame. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, team. Um, I'll, I'll, okay, let me try and let me try and summarize a little bit. So I think one of the things that you consider is this: it starts with the presentation, or I mean, rather with the context, uh, which is COVID on the one side, um, and obviously uh, you acknowledge that there's a drought, which is going to affect the possibility that, and, and, and pressure on food prices um, if it gets worse than it is already. Uh, there's going to be upward pressure on food prices. And then coming to the solutions, one of the things that you notice is basically uh, the resource, um, or rather first, the sufficient investments are not being made in agriculture as required. Uh, the use of resources should also go beyond, uh, use of resources should go beyond, uh, use of resources should go beyond, um, um, or rather that there has to be greater decentralization of resources so that uh, all resources that are invested by government should go as far as is possible to obviously other forms of uh, training, uh, extension services, um, and that. And that government spending has been inefficient, and I think that's demonstrable. 
And one of the ways that um, you are proposing is for that, um, the kind of smart investments, if I may call them that, which help to crowd in other private sector investments, uh, partly because then infrastructure, or rather, these kind of government investments would allow for more investments to take place, which would be useful for manufacturing, because obviously that would be agro-processing could take place. I think the other is one of the points that you are finishing with, which is basically that the kind of regulations that government has engaged in are partly uh, are not informed by data and good analysis, but more by other sentiment, and they need to perhaps meddle. As you said, uh, part of the problem is that Kenya is obviously sort of more to speak like uh, the market mover uh, because of the ability to supply volumes globally. So when there's a growth and with demand, with a growth in supply without demand being commensurate, there's, there's an expectation from a market perspective that obviously prices will fall. And that price fall itself is not necessarily the, the uh, a reflection of some rigging or some distortion in the market as opposed to just how the supply and demand would operate for a product of this kind. Uh, so regulations, I think, are not, have been, have not been very smart. And obviously that has created more grist, I mean, has created some tension in, uh, in the markets in Kenya which you suggest other neighbors uh, would, be taking a, would be taking advantage of. So I think the, the bigger idea is that when markets are operating efficiently, one of the things that you expect market to operate efficiently is to prices to go towards the costs, right? Uh, the marginal price is heading towards the cost. And what that means is that margins will be thin, which you know, more often than not is, an, um, is, a, is a reflection of the fact that that market is creating as much surplus as is possible, both on the consumer side and the producer side. Uh, so with that kind of analysis, I think we have to be careful that uh, uh, regulations and meddling in markets actually sometimes uh, harm more than they definitely harm. And in coffee, in, in, the, in the cost, in the last one year, we've seen that in tea. And let's hope that uh, part of what we maintain is that, yes, as much as possible, allow markets to operate uh, for agriculture in, in the best ways that's possible. And that's just basically by creating as few distortions and regulatory burdens as is possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, so we've had two presentations. Um, I apologize that Mr. George Sanga, who's also who's supposed who's in, uh, I think in South Sudan in Juba, is unable to connect because his connection is unstable. So we apologize. We did not get him to record his presentation, so he's not available for us. That leaves us with the two presentations from Job and from Team. So what I'd like to ask is anybody who has questions. I haven't seen any questions in the chat box yet, but whoever has questions or any responses to to any of them, uh, please state your name. And then you can ask that question. Um, and after that, well, I'll take three questions at a time. And then we'll ask Job and uh, team to respond to them. And then we'll come back for a, um, a second iteration or uh, a second sequence. So the first sequence is just basically, please switch on your microphone, switch on your camera, and then you can ask that question specifically to any one of them. Or if you have a common uh, comment to make, please make that. Don't take too much time. And then I'll go back to, so that we can have as many questions and a discussion going forward. Um, uh, the chat box also, I mean, the, the floating menu bar allows you to raise your hand. So if you have a question, please raise your hand so that I can see you and so that you can switch on. Um, once I, I point to you, you can switch on your, your microphone and your, and, your, and your camera so that you can ask a question. Is there anyone with a question? I haven't seen any yet. Let me see. Um, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I don't see any. Um, I don't see any. Okay, fine. I, I think as you as you as you try to get in touch with the, as, I mean, as you try to find this, let me let me let me ask a question of Job. Uh, uh, so 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 Job, uh, you made a fantastic presentation on behalf of the of the of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. But one of the things that I think um, I found quite notable is that when it came to, was it about the, uh, okay, two, two, two things. One is you suggested that there should be a tax refund fund, a specific fund that is established for the purposes of refund of taxes. Um, and that I find very, very interesting. Uh, part of the reason being that um, it's a suggestion that the, that fund should have some money so that of course it, it makes it quicker to to ref, to make refunds um i would like you to please suggest how would it who would be in charge of it uh because i i don't know whether that means it should be that it should be 
the responsibility of the revenue service or the treasury or both. Um, because that's interesting. What I know is that constitutionally there'd be a requirement for parliament to pass a specific law. Um, so that's the first thing that I think, and, and creation of funds in Kenya is a very delicate thing. We are now talking about the, the fund that was, <laughs> the price stabilization fund that was supposed to be created for petroleum, and you saw the mess that resulted when the cabinet secretary is, could not answer what happened to and how we account for those funds. So that makes me a bit jittery, but I think the logic of the establishment of a fund, I understand. So please just, just, just give us a view about what you think about that. So that's the first part. The second part is a general comment that I saw, and the comment is most of the proposals from the Association of Manufacturers are related to, to taxes. Um, well, you mentioned some things on, on, on regulations as well, but most of them I actually think are questions that are related to taxes. And what I note is that some of the taxes, or rather the, the, the proposals that you're making are tax changes that were made some two or three years ago, and your, your view is that we should actually go back to what the situation was two, three years ago, which suggests to me this tax change one way or the other every so often. And, and, the, and, the, and, I mean, and the fluctuations that actually create significant um, uh, instability or, or, or an absence of stability in the policy environment for business people and manufacturing. And manufacturing tends to be a medium term to long term investment. Uh, I'm just wondering whether by saying that let's go back to a tax regime that was there back before, you're not uh, reinforcing this view which every, which we suffer from, and I know you and I of course have discussed this privately as well, which is basically this switch it on and then after two years. So the experimentation that Treasury, and actually Parliament, not just Treasury, but Parliament, uh, does every so often. My view is that it calls us back to actually say, these things make Kenya's tax system extremely complex. And I think I'd have, I'm asking whether the Kenya Association of Manufacturers has a broad view about how to make taxes by sector or generally taxes uh, a simplified form of taxes. Because when we cite, in this country, we like to cite Singapore and Hong Kong. And I, I know about Hong Kong because I looked at it. The entire tax code of Hong Kong is 15 pages, 15. The entire tax code, I have a copy of it, if anybody needs it, please tell me, ask me for it. 15 pages. The tax code of Kenya, I and my colleague called uh, Leo tried to put it together. The income tax code itself is, I think, 800 or 900 pages. I mean, and that's before you put together all the other things related to, to, to the regulations that, um, that apply. So I'm just wondering where, what each, every year what this means. So do you have a, pro a proposal for simplification of the tax code? And I think that is one thing that Kenya's businesses should, should, uh, should insist upon. Because just because a tax code is long doesn't mean, um, I'd rather you just have a, a tax, doesn't mean it's more efficient in terms of creating taxes. If on the other hand, uh, it's going to create the administrative burden. So I'm really worried about the administrative burden of uh, that comes from taxes. So that's for job. For team, uh, I, I actually agree with you, Tim, about um, the, the idea the, uh, that government should convert much more of, 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 of the support that is provided to agriculture into uh, cash grants or that, because cash is very, very easy to, to manage. Uh, secondly, its distribution costs are low. Um, and th most importantly, it actually reinforces market formation because it allows for people to send rather for government to send. Uh, but Tim, maybe you need to comment as well about the absence of transparency and the delays that took place last year regarding the support that government was supposed to give to, to households when, when, when COVID came about and everything else. And the idea that some of, the, some, some, actually must, some of that money did not reach the right places. So obviously the infrastructure that is required uh, to, to, to send cash grants um, does exist. But for some reason, it's not working efficiently and the transparency around it is, is, is an issue. So I'm, I'm just wondering how, how that would happen. And the second part is, you mentioned a very important point, which is basically that government investments, um, even if we take about the Maputo Declaration, which many people talk about, but I like uh, government investments should crowd in private sector investments. Uh, could you give us a, a good example about how government investments could crowd in private sector investments? Because I see, one of the things the government did several years back uh, was that, was it 10,000 or 
12,000 acres in Galana Kulalu, uh, which is completely a mess. Um, but you can see that there's just doubling of effort in that area as well, as opposed to uh, accepting. So basically, the idea about government actually being able to crowd in private sector investment is usually, it's an, it's an extremely brilliant idea, except we don't see good examples for it. So instead, what government did, does, instead of crowding in investments by private sector, is actually displaces private sector. Because if you're investing 10,000 acres, I mean, 10,000, um, in 10,000 acres, was it 10,000 or 100,000 acres? In Galana, when that could have been done by a private sector, then the effectiveness is actually you've displaced private sector as opposed to crowded in private sector. So please, let's let's have that. And I'll reverse the order. So Job, you'll wait for a bit. Let me start with Tim, and then I'll come back to you. Thanks. So Tim, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kwame. I think uh, those are excellent, excellent contributions. So one, if I can start with the cash grant, and uh, yeah, we, we do we do we do acknowledge that um, the government put in place infrastructure. Yes, we had some inefficiencies last year, especially in rolling out uh, the, the cash grants to households. But then what, what it did, which, which we, we thought was was quite useful, and was, of course for learning, as, especially if you compare with what was there earlier, was that once households received the cash grants, uh, they were able to create effective demand and were able to demand you know, commodities that they require. Uh, opposed to what was happening earlier, where we usually purchase, uh, when we purchase, um, you know, food commodities that we want to distribute to households. For example, what usually what we'd expect is that they would purchase grain, uh, and then, for example, just take maize to those countries. The, the distribution cost of that alone is quite expensive. And uh, of course, if you remember when we had the same challenge in 2017. A lot of that grain was also being stolen and uh, being diverted to, to private markets. So this this would be much more. Of course, we need to strengthen accountability mechanisms uh, to ensure that one, those who are vulnerable are identified. Uh, how much is being distributed is also made public, and people can actually vet. And uh, I think we we stand a much better chance in terms of uh, making the expenditures more efficient using the cash transfers. Uh, when we come to the crowding in of private sector investments um yes we do have some good examples and i, I want to uh, use the case of sorghum value chain so in 20, 2010 what the government did was it started with private with uh, development partners uh lobbying the government to uh you know put more money in sorghum uh but then the government was a bit slow what so what the some development partners did they started working with research institutions to develop improved varieties for sorghum. And I think after the first trials, the government came in and uh, over the next four years, we had uh, doubled almost the number of um, improved varieties for sorghum that were available. Then, the, 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 then, of course, this was supposed now to be channeled to the private sector for uh, agro-processing. So what the government did then was to uh, you know, waive the I think they zero rated the, 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 the tax on, on sorghum beer, and that led to faster growth. You know, EABL now was able to mop up all the sorghum that was being produced. Unfortunately, uh, once it kicked in, and I think the government realized that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good source of revenue, they, you know, they, they brought in back the taxes before the, 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 the value chain could, 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 could stabilize. So what we've seen is that, yes, the industry has been going forward. We've seen further investments. Uh, they have even, for example, put up the, a much bigger plant in Kisumu for, for processing of uh, sorghum beer. But of course, that has been constrained by some of the challenges we've had. So when we when we have shocks, we do expect that uh, the government will come in and uh, um, you know provide some kind of uh, relief uh, to, to the stakeholders for them to be able to deal with the shock, uh, as opposed to you know when we you know, the government. I mean. And that, that that would be an example of a useful subsidy. You no, know, for example, in this year, where we have we expect shocks both as a result of uh, um, the, the drought and uh, the high costs of, of inputs, not necessarily because of the drought, but because of uh, you know the changes we have, even including the global markets. Then you would expect that the government would put in like a one a one time subsidy to kind of help farmers deal with the shocks. Another example I would give, which is now on the other side. When, remember when right now we in the first year last year the government kicked in the the e-voucher program 
So this is basically a subsidy uh, which is uh, meant to be target, more targeted uh, and uh, it's supposed to be a short time. So the, the, if you're a beneficiary of the e-voucher, you're expected to receive for the next now three years. So if you count, the, if you remove last year when uh, they first received the first disbursement, so they'll receive this year next year. And then after that, they, they're supposed to now uh, be able to be to go to the market and uh, be able to purchase what they need without the subsidy. So this year, by the government working with the private sector, previously what the government would do, would, it would import fertilizer, and then of course they would they would distribute it. Right now, the, the government is, is asking farmers to buy to the normal aggregate where they usually buy their, their, their stuff, and then the, the government pays a proportion of the price. So, the, so what happens is that the private sector doesn't lose business. The agro the agro dealers are not losing business, and they're still maintaining the objective where farmers are able to uh, um, use the same inputs uh, that that I mean that you're trying to get them to adapt. So we, we see, I think there are some. Of course, we don't have a lot of examples, but another example I would give also, I think, in terms of private sector investments, uh, would be rice the rice industry. If you look at what has happened in places like Moya, most much of that has been private sector driven. And actually what the government has done, um, you know, is to give a relief. So for example, if you look at the the, the, the recent program on mechanization, what the government did then was to give waivers, uh, as opposed to uh, you have now county governments buying tractors uh, and, and uh, you know, claiming that they can work for free. For farmers, that is clearly not sustainable. And in fact, if you check most of the counties that went that route, uh, those 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 tractors are now packed uh, because of very small things uh, that they couldn't maintain the maintenance. And of course, they were and was quite high, especially if if, if uh, they were not charging farmers. Um, then lastly, uh, Kwame, if you allow me, there is a question that uh, John had asked uh, on the on the role of. Um, uh, what government goals should be, especially to incentivize uh, organic farming, uh, and, and what the government can do to promote uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, and I think, yeah, we, we, we've seen um, uh, a rise in organic farming in the, in the last couple of years. Um, and um, I think the the, the the key thing to organic farming, of course, one is the awareness, and the more consumers are becoming uh, aware um, on the benefits of organic farming, then they 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 tend to demand more of those products. However, as if you look at the example that, for example, in the developed world, then they tend to treat organic organic products as as niche products. So this is not something that is meant to be consumed by everyone because it, it tends to be quite expensive. Um, but we can actually support the, the 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 people who want to do that. So having kind of a dual system. Where you have niche products that you know is targeted to consumers who uh, can and can demand and can afford to pay for those products, uh, but then for the general population, I think we cannot mandate that uh, you know we 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 go organic. But the government has a key role in uh, first of all knowledge, because one of the key reasons why farmers misuse pesticide is lack of knowledge. And I can give an example when we had the fall armyworm, uh, farmers would go purchase one thing. Uh, but then when they are purchasing from the agrovet, they don't know what they're purchasing. So you go to an agrovet and you'll be like, I have this worm that we need to kill. And the agrovet will sell you the the product that he has, uh, regardless of whether it is effective in killing the fallen worm or not. And as a result of that, what farmers ended up doing was to mix uh, a number of pesticides to come up with a more lethal cocktail that would be able to eradicate that. So the, the collapse of the extension system you know, plays a big role in, in, in the current scenario that we're seeing. So if we can uh, find ways of um, you know, in enhancing knowledge, uh, and then also when it comes to regulations, I think uh, the Kenya again has one of the uh, well-advanced uh, regulatory um, environment for, for, for use of pesticides. I think one of the key challenges has been the enforcement of that, so that we make sure that you know, people who are using uh, the use and disposal of um, pesticides is up to the standard to the extent that it doesn't poison the environment, it doesn't contaminate the food. And um, you know, ideally, we, we believe, especially if you look at the, 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 the typical farmer, a typical farmer rarely sells you something that is noxious poisonous. For example, 
if, I, if you look at the the, the small older farmers who do horticulture, once they spray their tomawiki or tomatoes, you know, if you go to buy from them, they wouldn't sell to you. So we think that also the legislation should also support uh, that. For, and, and some of the key legislation has been in discussion, it's only that it's, it's, we've never gotten to, to pass it and enact it, like the geographic indications being that we can actually be able to trace food from where it is actually grown. So that if we can have that supporting structure, then that can really be of great use, especially for organic farmers. And, and in creating confidence that you know you're actually growing some. I mean, if you're going to purchase something at a premium price, you will act, you have more confidence in what you're purchasing, and you can actually trace it back to where it was grown. So that if somebody misbehaves, then uh, an effective punishment can be made. So I want to yield it back to Kwame, and then we can respond to the next issues. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, so, Job, uh, you remember your two questions, and there's another question in the chat box. If you can't uh, read it, I'll read it out for you as well. Oh, yeah. Thank uh, Kwame. I've seen the, the two questions that are in the chat. Uh, I'll first of all start with the, uh, your two questions uh, before I get to uh, the other two that are on the chat. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, uh, the tax refund fund as you have asked, uh, is quite integral because you'll find that uh, the funds that are due uh, for refund by the National Treasury are in billions of shillings, but you'll find that the allocation that is done per, per month uh, is about 2 billion at most, so 2.5 uh, for refund. And this is really hurting uh, the refund uh, speed, and especially when you're talking of uh, credit adjustment voucher uh withholding vat and then now the, the normal refund uh you've asked where where this should be placed i would uh propose that uh instead of it uh, being closer to where the consolidated fund is at the national treasury uh, that this should sit with kra so that kra can look at how much they have in their account uh, if they have 50 billion they can really tell that after verification of all the documents within this period of time uh, we can be able to clear out this and uh, as clear, clearly as we had stated earlier, this will require some legislative amendment uh, for KRA, KRA uh, to have, instead of what they receive monthly as 2 million or 2 billion or 2.5 billion, they start now receiving good fund uh, that is uh, well kept at a, a, a certain authority uh, and they can review it over time based on uh, the, 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 the refunds that uh, have been uh, that have been requested by the private sector. Uh, so that we can see the liquidity uh, kicking in uh, as far as the private sector operations are concerned. Uh, so for this to sit at the National Treasury, I would find it as um, as a prejudicial. Uh, it's, it's not likely to work easily. But when there is transfer, actual transfer of fund uh, from the consolidated fund for this purpose of uh, refunding uh, uh, of refunding the the due uh, the due uh, refunds, uh, this is likely to increase the efficiency uh, in the process. So I propose that the, the principal agency uh, to have uh, the custody of uh, this funds should be Kenya Revenue Authority. Uh, the second one you have asked about CAM, and uh, it's uh, uh, on of call for policy change as far as the taxation regime is concerned. One thing I have to state is that uh, currently we don't have what we call na national taxation policy. And we have been calling for this for the last six, seven years, uh, something that has not happened. We thought that is likely to, to, to come through when we did comprehensive review of the Income Tax Act in 2017. But again, uh, we thought that these other subsets of the national uh, taxation policy would also be considered as, uh, as uh, at that time that we are doing the change of national uh, of the, the Income Tax Act uh, 2017. Uh, some things you realize uh, that are likely to be healed by the national taxation policy is lack of public participation. And you have asked why we keep uh, calling for us to go back to the status quo. It's because when we, there is lack of public participation, you find that the government adopts a position that adds up hurt in the private sector. Uh, for instance, when we're talking of like now the IDA, uh, introducing a, 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 a flat rate of 50% on investment deduction allowance uh, of, across the whole country, that one disadvantages the county, uh, the county government, or uh, or the counties where investments are supposed to take place, and where there is less investment at the moment. So, for us to call for reversion 
to where we were before is so that we can see investment drive, job drive, as we had invest in, in, envisaged in our in, in our strategies are happening uh, because we have seen some of the, our, our members, some of the investors now holding back because of lack of uh, such allowances. So there's, if there is public participation that is taking place, I'll say again, uh, there is non-implementation of what the public uh, 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 presents uh, either to the parliament or to the national treasury. Uh, for instance, if we talk of uh, uh, the introduction of like now the 10% uh, the, 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 the on resin, uh, this is something that was not discussed uh, at the public particip participation stage. This is something that CAM had not considered yet. Resin, it is a CAM manufacturers that are using it. And you can see it was uh, introduced at the parliamentary level without due consolidation, consolidation, uh, consideration of CAM. So that's why we are asking, can we go back to where we were without that excess duty of 10%? Because you have some manufacturers that are, are hurting at the moment. Or even when we took over 1% minimum tax, uh, it was introduced without any consultation with, uh, with the private sector. So that's why we have to keep calling for reversion to the status quo until we have effective public participation happening and until where we have uh, the infusion of uh, the public view and the private view uh, to come up with an, a policy or to come up with a, with, with a bill, uh, to come up with an act of uh, parliament. So what uh, we have to say is that um, the public participation is wanting and you find that the government, even if there's public participation that has taken place, does not consider the views that have been aired uh, by the public. Uh, so for us to be able to cure, cure against all these is a question of having what I'm calling the national tax policy that should say that we have 800 pages, 700 pages of our taxation procedures, of our, ta uh, of our tax, uh, tax administration. This is what should be fought by the whole country in a very simplist uh, simplistic manner. Because what one thing you realize, uh, our current... Um, uh, tax uh, environment lacks what I, I would call the broad application or lacks what uh, I would call the, a tax base, uh, a, a larger tax base. You find that again, if uh, there is an introduction of a tax on, on manufacturers, it is the same tax tax that will be in, uh, will be increased the next time because they're feeling that, that this is a low hanging fruit. So you find that uh, we have high tax rate and low uh, or, 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 or shrunk uh, a tax base that, that, that has shrunk. When you look at the issues now to do with the issues of compliance again, when you call for the reduction of uh, uh, the, the withholding VAT from 2% to 1%, it's because you're feeling that it is no longer an intelligence uh, collection mechanism by KRA. It is a tool that is being used at the moment for cash lending uh, to the government and then delaying in issuing out uh, the refunds. So ease of compliance now uh, is complicated at, at that stage. Or when you look at now the expenditure matching as one of the principles of uh, taxation, uh, taxation uh, procedures, uh, whereby if you look at the minimum tax, 1%, was introduced uh, to be uh, taxed on the gross turnover, whereby even the loss-making companies, the startups were supposed to pay up from the beginning. Or even when we're talking of the 10, uh, 10 uh, billion uh, Kenya shillings uh, investment in four years, this is something that has not been, been, been discussed with the private sector, and something that we're looking at how the private sector can be involved uh, in uh, at the public participation stage so that we have effective taxation measures uh, being in, being uh, introduced by the government, whereby there is an, an understanding between the private sector and, uh, and the public sector. The other thing uh, that has been asked in the chat is uh, to do with, uh, again, taxation. Uh, that uh, uh, as, as manufacturers, we normally talk more about taxation measures that are supposed to be taken by the government uh, for us to remain competitive. There are other things that uh, we call now and then. For instance, we are calling for value, uh, value chain integration, backward and forward integration, whereby at the moment there is sourcing of about 80% of the raw materials and intermediate products internationally rather than uh, sourcing locally. And given that 50% of our manufacturers in the country are in food production, are, are in the agrarian-based uh, production, uh, you find that if we do our back, backward inter integration, Dr. Uh, Dr. Timothy can talk about these. You said that there are very many jobs that can be obtained in between uh, sourcing of the raw materials locally and uh, our production processes at the, at, the, at, the, at the manufacturing level. So we have been trying to work very hard with the various farmers 
uh, with various miners, with various whatnot, to ensure that we are integrating backward our, our value chain processes so that we can generate as much value add, uh, 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 value add as possible. Something else is when we talk of the export drive. Uh, a country cannot grow, cannot de generate wealth if it is only trading by itself. Uh, we are looking at how we can have a competitive manufacturing sector that is uh, that is driving uh, the, the economy through the export-led economic growth model. Uh, so again, uh, we are pushing for the implementation of the five uh, objectives uh, of the National Export Development and Promotion Strategy that was developed by the State Department of Trade in 2017. Uh, so that we can grow our export level and drive the wealth uh, creation of our nation. Again, uh, we are we are working on the fight against ELC trade. This is a, is a major menace you saw on the Daily Nation about uh, two three days ago, where we're talking about 40% of the market share is being controlled by ELC trade uh, uh, produced goods, uh, either contrabands, counterfeit, other customed, other valued. Uh, talk of substandard goods, such kind of ELC trade is what is taking 40% of the market share. If we can have the rightful share of the market, you see again the fashion sector contribution to the GDP instead of declining uh, increasing. Again, uh, calling for buy, uh, buy Kenya, build Kenya, another very good strategy uh, that uh, not only the government should adopt, but even us as uh, the private citizens should adopt and ensuring that what we are, uh, we, are, we are putting on is made in Kenya, what we are consuming is made in Kenya, what we are driving is made in Kenya. Uh, all, all these that, uh, that, that, that we partake in our daily lives, we should ensure that it is made in Kenya so that we can drive the manufacturing sector growth and then we can see subsequently its contribution uh, to the GDP uh, increasing. Nonetheless, we have to ensure that the taxation is fair uh, it is administrative, its administration is easy, uh, and this can only be achieved when we have what we're calling the national, national, national taxation policy. The last one is on the 10% uh, 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 excise uh, on uh, the plastic, and the question why we are calling for, it, uh, for its annulment or for it to be, uh, to be removed. One thing you can realize this is, is a double effort. Uh, we have uh, what is called the responsible production and consumption as one of the SDG uh, goals, and this is the goal number 12. It calls for, yes, produce, but ensure there is, uh, there is, a, there is a responsible cons consumption of the same. And then at the fees, you find this what we call the circular economy. And in the circularity of the economy, whereby there is no wastage of the, of the, of, of the ed products, or there's no wastage of uh, any product in, 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 in manufacturing is whereby now we have come up with what we're calling exceeded producer responsibility, whereby manufacturers have to ensure that any plastic that is manufactured, anything that is manufactured in form of plastic, once it is consumed, there is a way of that it fights back uh, to the manufacturing farm. And if not that, there is a revenue that is being contributed to ensure that there is, there is no, there is no uh, spillage or there is no uh, dumping of the plastic uh, by plastic uh, packaging that are used uh, anywhere uh, within the country. So the external producer responsibility, if you can take some time to have a look at it, you see that is the next excellent uh, program. We have even come up with an organization that is looking at now the external producer responsibility called CAPRO. Uh, so uh, that uh, organization is charged in ensuring that there is responsible production and there is a responsible consumption of the plastic uh, in the country. And then the other thing even that is making us uh, call for uh, with, uh, removal of that 10% excess uh, duty on, uh, on, on plastic is that, and I, I talked about this earlier, you find that uh, the, 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 the plastic that is imported uh, uh, in form of packaging, uh, it is not uh, charged the 10% excess duty. We are only charging this on what is locally manufactured. This is unfair. This is unlevel, unlevel play, playing field. So you find that the rest of the world is still using plastic. It's only us that are punitive to the use of plastic. It's only until that time that I will be able to eradicate at the global level the usage of plastic that we should.
Uh, sorry, everybody, I think we lost Job. I can't hear him anymore. Let's give him a couple of minutes. Oh, Job, we'd lost you for a couple of minutes. Do you hear any point about plastics? Tell yes, me. yes, we had the point about, about, about plastics. Yeah. Was that the end? Was that the last? OK, uh, so let me check. I think it looks like there's a connection problem from him. Um, so uh, I don't see any other questions. So what I'll do is I'll ask each of us to make a, a, a concluding remarks. Uh, so let's start. Let's start with you, Job. Any any concluding remarks? Uh, Kwame, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Job. I can hear you. A fiscal constraint uh, a government running. Uh, we have the general elections that are all, uh, that, that are around the corner, and we have the pandemic uh, that, uh, we are, that, that we are we are facing the COVID nineteen pandemic. What I would ask is that uh, let's continue uh, trying to support the economic development, social development, political development of this country, but not forgetting that we are in a, that a trilemma situation, and we need to overcome or to rebound stronger from where we are post general election, uh, post uh, the COVID and also post a fiscal constraint a government running. So that uh, post uh, 2023. Uh... Right, we lost him again. Uh... OK, thanks, Job. Uh, what about team? Team, could you have your final comments? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kwame. Um, I think for in, in, in conclusion, uh, I think what I can say is that, um, yeah, we, 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 we are grateful for the opportunity to make these proposals. Uh, I think the way you had summarized them clearly captured the essence of what we, we are proposing, that one, we need to raise investments within the sector, uh, but not just raise investments, but we need to make sure that we, we can actually utilize them uh, more efficiently. Um, uh, so that we can make good use of you know, the little investments, the little resources that actually come. And one of the ways we can do this, of course, is leveraging on private sector investments. But for us to be able to do this, we need to reevaluate uh, public expenditures um, and, and try to unblock the inefficiencies that we, we've seen so far. Uh, taxation seems to be a thorn almost on everybody's flesh, especially in the production side of things. Uh, the government needs to rethink uh, the the, the, the taxation policies, but I think the, the, the problem has been that we engage the wrong person. Uh, last year when we were engaged, we tried to engage the Kenya Revenue Authority, uh, but clearly these laws are made in parliament, so KRE just enforces them. So uh, we, we don't get very far by going that route. It's better when we actually lobby uh, both the Committee of Agriculture, uh, the, the Finance Committees to kind of uh, provide feedback on the effect of some of these taxes, especially um, that they have on, on business and the private sector. I think that will be able to to have better, uh, better, better, better outcomes. Uh, and then finally, um, yeah, we also need to lobby treasury, especially on uh, some of the financial management policies. Uh, right now, the 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 PFM in itself, I think, uh, does not uh, have, brings about some some challenges for the sector um, uh, without even going further than uh, looking at, for example, the delays. So, for example, if you look at this year, uh, counties only got their quota this year, this, this, this quarter, they only got their funds this quarter. Uh, and you see, for, for even for the short range, there is little room to, to get activities going. So, we think that uh, we, 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 I think in the, in the, in the submission, we'll make uh, clear what some of these proposals are in terms of the revisions to the PFM Act, um, so that actually at a policy level, Treasury can consider uh, these revisions along with the other revisions that are being proposed. So we want to thank you again and uh, wish you everyone a good afternoon. Good day. All right. Oh, so thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Um, so as we conclude, I think I'd like to just mention two things. 
one of the things that I found most uh, um, frightening is the fact that, as Job mentioned, that 40% of the goods that are circulating in some sectors of our market are illicit or illegal, uh, being either contraband um, or goods for which proper taxes were not paid or substandard goods. Um, and in my view, that's a significant in that serious indictment to, to Kenya's laws and policies, because to have laws and policies where you almost have an equal number of, 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 of uh, illicit goods trading side and side, side by side with the goods that have been manufactured, for which obviously taxes have been paid, and which have uh, uh, taxes and all, which connects to the to the formal economy. Uh, um, I mean, to the proper economy is actually an indictment. It's telling you that policies uh, as they exist, whether it's the taxation policies, sector policies, regulation, and, and even uh, the, the levies and all the taxes that apply are actually having no effect. Uh, I think that's dangerous. So that maybe is, is, is one goal that we need to think about. And it's suggesting that there are significant distortions in the policy in a way that generates those. Some of those, of course, are probably um, uh, things that affect not just domestic, I mean, things that don't not just affect tax collection, but they also affect the way other firms operate and the ability to create uh, new jobs. So I think that's an important one. It's just telling us that this is a policy failure. If you have 40% of goods flowing in, wherever they might be from, that are considered illicit trade, then obviously that's an indictment. I think the second question is we need to be conscious of the fact that next year is an elections year, and therefore the, the public finance frame and the budgets will be um, against that background of elections. And like many people, I don't uh, usually don't approach elections with as much trepidation. I think the thing is we have to let the time pass. Uh, hopefully, uh, everything maintains. Institutions of government do their role, keeping everybody safe, keeping the economy running, and not taking significant risks. I mean, not taking risks with uh, with monetary or, or fiscal policy. Uh, I think that's one thing to also emphasize. Uh, the other one is. Um, there's going to be a drought, I think it's clear, uh, or at least there's going to be a shortage, uh, there's going to be uh, pressure, upward pressure on food prices, uh, whether it comes from the petroleum side or whether it comes from the shocks that come from supply uh, disruptions, um, how government responds, whether it's allowing stocks to come in, in in good time, competition to ensure that it's efficient and all that just tells you. So all these things tell me one thing that it's in our general interest uh, as part of budget performance, well, the budget is the important role that government takes every year that is most involving of the public or rather the most open to public participation. I think it's suggesting to us that one of the things we have to bring back to government is, look, sound economics and managing the economy is something that you must have at all times. Because with the public debt overhang, as we, we now know, uh, government is under a program with the IMF of 38 months and let's hope that government sticks to its side keeps the economy stable uh, so that as the COVID-19 effects wear off completely, and obviously we are glad that uh, vaccination is taking place when it's ramped up, uh, then it will be possible for the economy, one, to reopen, but also for manufacturing and all other sectors to continue to work properly. So that's the, that's the idea that we have. Um, that's what, what I consider. But I think uh, we take two things. One, it's clear from team and, 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 and job that uh, uh, government, even for the resources that it has, is not operating very efficiently. And the idea of always throwing taxes uh, as a way to fix uh, regulatory and sector problems, I think is coming to a head uh, and it's time to re-examine how these things happen. But more importantly, let's also remember that budgets are laws. And so part of what we do here, the memorandum that the IEA will, will prepare, will not just be sent all the way to, to Treasury because that would be important, but at the same time to remember that for the fiscal, the other laws that need to come together to make a budget and uh, entirely coherent must be our engagement with members of the members of the National Assembly, but also members of, of the Senate. So this work shouldn't end with us speaking to each other. I think part of this is just to have a clearinghouse where we can put together coherent ideas. The IEA will draw a memorandum, which we will share in another public forum such as this, but more importantly, also send it to Treasury and also put it forward. And you all know, I think you all know that uh, uh, today uh, a memorandum came out um, from, 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 from the Treasury uh, stating the dates of the sector working groups. Um, I think sometime from next month, uh, between 7th, I think, between 8th to 13th of this month. So uh, if you need it, the IEA can send you a copy of that. But there's one that's been sent from the, from the Treasury today where the working groups will be taking place at the at the amphitheater of the Kenya 
KICC, uh, I suspect from next week. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow we'll have the second day of our sector submissions and we'll be dealing with the social sector. So we'll have a couple of, uh, um, of uh, presentations as well, starting from 10 o'clock at the same time. And the presentations will be sector social sector submissions related to education, related to health, related to water, related to overall governance and um, uh, um, governance, of course, corruption, and also uh, uh, regarding uh, rights and all that. So tomorrow from 10 o'clock, we invite you to another session such as this and hope that uh, you'll find it as interesting as this is. And as I promised, at the end of this, we'll consolidate all this, we'll provide a synthesis and present it for, for public review, but at the same, same time to present it to, to Parliament and to the Treasury. So thank you very much for sitting here with us. And if you have any other questions, I will ask both Job and, uh, and, uh, and team um, privately whether they, they, they would approve for us to circulate the presentations. If they do that, then it will be sent to each and every one of you. So whoever is interested, please send us an email on admin at iekenya.org.ke and we'll make sure that it's available for you to, to for your further reading, but also for, for your public education. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Job. Um, and thank you very much, team. They've always honored our invitations and we're very glad uh, that you've done that for this year as well. So all of us, as we all started, it's in our interest that Kenya's economy becomes more efficient, our people's productivity increase, and prosperity should follow this. So that's the spirit in which we hold these things, and let's all continue to have these discussions um, at all moments, ensuring that Kenya is always going forward. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.